Hi, this is the AI Storyteller. I'm Mark. In this issue, we will delve into one of the world's most famous crime novels, The Talented Mr. Ripley, written by the American author Patricia Haysmith. Among the 50 greatest crime novelists, as ranked by Time magazine in the United States, Patricia Haysmith stands at the top. Her most significant work, The Talented Mr. Ripley, not only received the Edgar Allan Poe Award and the French Detective Literature Award but has also been adapted into film and television series multiple times, exerting a profound influence worldwide. To understand the talented Mr. Ripley, one cannot ignore the author's unique life experiences. Patricia Haysmith was born in 1921 in Texas, USA. While her family was not impoverished, her parents' relationship was troubled. Her birth was an accident as her artist's parents, both involved in commercial art, did not want a child to disrupt their careers, exacerbating the already escalating family conflicts. Her mother even attempted abortion multiple times using turpentine. When abortion failed, her parents hurriedly divorced just nine days before her birth. Haysmith grew up with her mother and stepfather, well aware of being an unwanted child. According to Haysmith's later accounts, the childhood trauma she endured marked the beginning of her lifelong psychological struggles. This turmoil led to her premature maturity and rebelliousness. She read Dostoevsky's novels and studied scientific papers on pathological human behavior at the age of nine. At thirteen, she hung two cross daggers in her bedroom. From her school years onwards, her extraordinary beauty and unique demeanor captivated both men and women. After a series of tumultuous relationships, Haysmith finally realized her preference for romantic involvement with women. However, she never had a stable partner she could completely trust and rely on throughout her life. After turning 40, the various health issues resulting from years of alcohol abuse transformed her into a different person, both in appearance and health. Even in such circumstances, Haysmith stubbornly refused to share her life with anyone even expelling friends from her hospital room before her death in 1995. She passed away in solitude, much like her lonely birth. Throughout her life, Haysmith struggled with unstable mental health and often displayed pathological tendencies. These symptoms had a complex and peculiar relationship with her writing. On one hand, fiction deepened her delusions, trapping her in the world she created. On the other hand, her works delved into the psychology of human crime which in turn suppressed her antisocial tendencies in the real world. In her later years, it was not uncommon to see this female writer standing alone at parties, burning strands of her own hair by candlelight. Her friends generally believed that if she did not rely on writing to experience and exorcise the toxins of evil in a virtual sense, her fate would have likely been either a prison cell or a mental institution. However, overall, Haysmith's novels were not as chaotic and unruly as her mental state. Her stories were characterized by meticulous logic, sensational themes, and polished prose, making them highly popular in the commercial and especially the European markets. In the cultural sphere, Ms. Haysmith had a following that included elites such as the renowned novelist Graham Greene, the poet Ogden, and the filmmaker Alfred Hitchcock. At less than 30 years of age, Patricia Haysmith's debut thriller novel, Stranger on the Train, was adapted into a film by Alfred Hitchcock. Following this, her only romance novel, The Price of Salt, became the first openly published work featuring a lesbian theme in history. This novel was later adapted into the popular film Carol a few years ago, which brought renewed attention to the original work. Looking at Haysmith's career, it becomes evident that her exceptional talent had ample opportunity to flourish from the very beginning of her literary journey, making her development relatively smooth. However, the work that unquestionably cemented her position in the literary world, particularly in the realm of crime fiction, is the Ripley series. The first installment of the Ripley series, and arguably the most famous work of Haysmith's lifetime, is the novel we are currently deciphering, The Talented Mr. Ripley, published in 1955. As for the inspiration behind this novel, Haysmith's account is quite enigmatic. In the early 1950s, it is said that she was plagued by various strange thoughts every day. She often felt that every person passing by her on the sidewalk could potentially be a compulsive thief or even a murderer. One day, 
while vacationing in Italy, she stood on the hotel balcony and happened to see a man walking on the beach, which seemed to shock her like an electric jolt. At that moment, there was a clothing store sign nearby that read Ripley, and she casually used it as the surname for this unfamiliar man. Simultaneously, she rapidly designed a life path for this man, half exposed to the envy of the world's eyes and half hidden in dark corners. Now, let's follow this character into the story. As the story begins, this man named Tom Ripley appears quite ordinary. With just a few strokes, we gather some information. He works in the accounting department of an advertising company in New York. He is often solitary, always short on cash, and doesn't even have a bank account. He has a talent for mathematics and a bit of social experience, having engaged in a few shady activities, particularly excelling at lying without a change in expression, forging various documents, and extorting small sums of money from the wealthy. One day at a bar, he realizes he's being followed by someone. He initially assumes it's because the police have discovered his past misdeeds, but to his surprise, the person who approaches him introduces himself as Dickie's father. Tom's mind flashes with a vague impression, vaguely recalling that Dickie was a young man who was a casual acquaintance a few years back, someone he could only consider as an acquaintance. In Tom's memory, Dickie was a wealthy playboy, always with a wide smile, curly golden hair, and a face that attracted opportunities from every direction. Compared to Tom's own circumstances, Dickie was fortunate in every aspect. However, now Dickie's father appears helpless in front of Tom. It turns out that Dickie has been in Europe for two years, and his family hoped he would study ship design and eventually take over the family shipyard business when he returned to the United States. But Dickie's interests lie in art, women, and indulgence. Dickie's father has gone to great lengths to find Tom, hoping that this friend of Dickie's, who is the same age, can make a trip to Europe to persuade Dickie to return to America. Of course, Dickie's father is willing to cover all the expenses for this journey. Tom readily accepted this mission. Even before he boarded the ship to Italy, the novel had carefully elaborated on various details that demonstrated Tom's psychological changes. Firstly, in his eyes, everything in New York had become coarse, fake, and hypocritical. The entire city seemed to be staging a grand performance just for him. He felt that once he set sail in a couple of days, the entire city of New York would immediately collapse like cardboard on a stage. Where was the new stage? It was, of course, the Europe he was about to embark upon. Tom was becoming increasingly tense, entering a state of excitement akin to stepping onto a stage. At least initially, Tom envisioned himself in a positive and hopeful role. Based on instructions from Dickie's family, he helped purchase clothing for Dickie and even bought himself a decent outfit. Contrary to Tom's usual practice, he could have easily charged these expenses to Dickie's account, but he didn't. Instead, he paid for it himself. We can see that at this moment, Tom viewed this trip to Europe as an opportunity to start a brand new life. He told himself that he could finally bid farewell to all the mediocrity that he had been associating with in New York. Even though the direction was entirely different, his mindset was akin to those immigrants who abandoned everything left their homeland, wiped the slate clean of all their mistakes, and ventured to the new world of America, believing in a fresh start. After boarding the ship, he found a fruit basket in his cabin with a card wishing him a safe journey, a gift from Dickie's parents. Before this, Tom had never received such gifts. To him, these were items typically displayed in the windows of florist shops, exorbitantly priced and usually greeted with a dismissive smile. In a sudden and unexplainable moment of emotion, he found tears welling up in his eyes and even covered his face with both hands, sobbing. After boarding the ship, there is a detail worth noting. Tom asked the librarian in the first-class cabin if they had Henry James's novel, The Ambassadors. In The Ambassadors, the male protagonist is also commissioned by an American employer to find the employer's son. During the course of the story, despite some emotional complications, he eventually completes the task. Haysmith cleverly pays homage to the source story of the talented Mr. Ripley, the ambassadors, with this detail. However, the styles and plot developments of the two stories are vastly different, and the subsequent plot of the talented Mr. Ripley completely overturns the framework of the ambassadors. 
Upon arriving in Naples, Italy, Tom didn't have to exert much effort to locate Dickie on the beach. Dickie was indeed a classic ladies' man, accompanied by his athletic writer girlfriend, Marge. If we closely follow Tom's perspective, we might sense that he was immediately drawn to Dickie with admiration and envy, while harboring hostility towards Marge. In his view, Marge was in love with Dickie, but Dickie treated her no differently from a 50-year-old Italian maid. Initially, Tom faithfully carried out his mission, conveying Dickie's father's message and attempting to persuade Dickie to return home. However, he faced Dickie's resolute resistance. Dickie wanted to remain in Europe and continue to live a carefree life. Not only that, Dickie quickly engulfed Tom's lifestyle and spirit like a whirlwind. Tom moved into Dickie's house, living with him and Marge. To please Dickie, Tom voluntarily shared the living expenses given to him by Dickie's father. We can observe that during this process, Tom became deeply engrossed in the role he had created for himself, to the point where he found it increasingly difficult to extricate himself. His daily aspiration was to amuse Dickie, accompany him on sailing trips, and utilize his spare time to learn various European languages, as if these days would never end. However, the end came swiftly. On one hand, Dickie's father continued to send letters, increasingly pressing for Dickie's return. If Dickie showed no intention of going back, Tom's mission would be canceled, and his source of income in Europe would naturally be cut off. On the other hand, Tom's dedication gradually made Dickie aware of something amiss. The novel's tenth chapter marks the first significant turning point. One day, Tom sees Dickie and Marge deeply involved in each other, which deeply shakes him. Confused, he enters Dickie's bedroom, opens his closet, and takes out his clothes, ties, and hats, putting them on one by one. In the mirror, Tom takes on Dickie's appearance, mimicking his voice and actions, crafting fictional dialogue for Dickie. These lines roughly convey the message, Marge, I don't love you. You've come between me and Tom. This famous detail is described in detail and vividly, sending shivers down one's spine. In various film and television adaptations of Genius Ripley, this scene has been a centerpiece to test actors' skills. Just as Tom was getting carried away, Dickie suddenly appears before him. Tom's behavior both disgusts and frightens him. Dickie warns Tom not to tamper with his belongings and not to harbor unrealistic fantasies about his sexual orientation. A irreparable rift forms between them. In Tom's view, this incident not only signifies his emotional rejection and mockery, but also marks the end of his fantasy that he was on the same level as Dickie and living a similar life. He is about to be sent back to his original state, returning to the hopeless life of a small-time hoodlum in the United States. However, the problem is that at this point, Tom, both mentally and physically, can no longer revert to his former self. Tom's motivation to kill Dickie is gradually built up in this manner. He seizes an opportunity when he and Dickie go to San Remo for a visit, and Marge is conveniently not with them. He tricks Dickie onto a motorboat. When they are out in the vast sea, Tom persuades Dickie to swim, and while Dickie is busy removing his pants, Tom suddenly raises an oar and strikes him on the head. Haysmith's description of the subsequent actions is accurate, meticulous, and cold-blooded. The words alone can make one's palms sweaty. Tom ruthlessly extinguishes Dickie's attempts to survive time and time again. Even during the process of tossing Dickie's body into the sea, it is written with twists and turns, heart pounding, and Tom almost falls into the sea himself during this process. After writing this murder scene, only about half of the novel has passed. Surprisingly, Tom does not flee the scene in fear but, after completing a series of cleanup tasks, he returns to Naples. He calmly faces Marge's inquiries, saying that Dickie plans to stay in Rome for a while and asked him to retrieve some belongings. Then, Tom enters Dickie's house, loots most of his valuable possessions, and falsely claims that he will bring these items to Rome to meet up with Dickie. To some extent, the story truly begins from this point. Tom's elimination of Dickie from the mortal world means that he will inevitably have to face many holes that need filling in order to maintain the deception. The originally timid and unimpressive Tom is thereby stimulated to unleash his maximum evil potential, and it's only here that we truly understand why the book is titled Genius. As soon as he boards the train to Rome, 
he begins to plan how to write letters in Dickie's name, appease his girlfriend, deceive his parents into continuing to provide funds. Subsequently, whether in Rome or Paris, Tom appears as Dickie, with his identity and appearance. Surprisingly, he moves freely because most of the party guests have never met Dickie in person or have only had limited interactions with him. The various foreshadowing elements planted in the novel's earlier portrayal of Tom's character, such as his fondness for imitating others' attire, gestures, and tones, his proficiency in forging documents, and his unflappability in the face of crises, all come into clear play at this point. Gradually, Tom's impersonation of Dickie becomes deeply ingrained in these social circles, and the true Dickie is gradually erased from memory. From donning Dickie's clothes to becoming Dickie himself, we begin to fathom Tom's psychological logic behind the crimes. In his view, killing Dickie is essential to become Dickie, to freely shuttle between these two identities. Thus, he believes that murder is the only way. Therefore, after establishing a series of social connections under the guise of Dickie in Rome and Paris, Tom opens a bank account under his original name, Tom Ripley, and slowly transfers Dickie's assets into it. What's interesting is that the novel unfolds entirely from Tom's perspective, so we see these heinous acts as a logical progression, completely in line with his own twisted reasoning. He would tell himself matter-of-factly, after all, he has to take care of two people at the same time. How should we interpret a character like Tom? The novel contains a particularly insightful passage. Tom felt lonely but not at all lonely, an odd feeling, and he felt almost sure that nobody in the world would ever guess what he was doing. Yet he felt he was doing something everyone else was doing, only his work was more important because of the way he looked at it. Tom believes that a good actor, when portraying a role he feels is uniquely his, experiences this kind of sensation on stage. He was himself and not himself, and he saw things he could not have seen as he was. He felt other things, and he knew he couldn't have felt them as he was. At this point, from the moment he wakes up to brush his teeth, Tom becomes Dickie. He eats boiled eggs just like Dickie, selects a tie from the hanger as Dickie would, and even paints a picture in Dickie's style. From a psychological perspective, Tom and Dickie form an alter-ego relationship. In fact, the interest in alter ego is reflected in many of Patricia Highsmith's works. Researchers of Highsmith's works argue that this interest can be traced back to her earlier experiences. She had just graduated from college at the time and had written a large number of stories exclusively for comics publishers. The 1940s were a time when American comics were flourishing, so the fees for writing stories for comics were several times higher than those for regular writing making it an important source of income for Highsmith, who was actively seeking financial independence at the time. However, looking back at Highsmith's entire creative career, this step was not just about economic significance. If we search for the term alter ego on Wikipedia, we can find a long section citing American comics as examples. The dual persona of Clark Kent, who wears glasses and formal attire during the day, and Superman, who dons a cape and saves the world by night, represents the most famous and typical example of an alter ego. This fictional model was replicated extensively, like a virus, in the highly profitable comic book industry, far more so than in the world of novels, and Highsmith was one of the highly efficient replicators of this model. Recalling these events, Patricia Highsmith once said, When I formally began to write novels, I was determined not to let these serialized comics influence my writing. I believe they didn't influence it. On the contrary, I could probably benefit greatly from these silly but compact plot setups. Clearly, what Highsmith meant by benefit encompasses the pace of plot development and the lifelong question she explored, the tense relationship between a person's alter ego and their self. How much energy can this relationship generate? and more specifically in the context of criminal behavior, how destructive can this energy be? Returning to the story, of course, Tom's carefree days couldn't continue indefinitely, and dramatic crises soon follow. First, Dickie's wealthy friend Freddie comes to Rome and directly seeks him out. Freddie had met Tom before, so Tom has to switch back to his own identity and awkwardly handle the situation. However, Freddie begins to notice more and more inconsistencies, and as the situation seems on the brink of exposure, 
Tom unexpectedly uses an ashtray to kill Freddy. He then pretends to help a drunk man home, moving the body outside. The Roman police quickly open an investigation, and Tom once again assumes Dickie's identity, leading the police to suspect Dickie. In other words, at this point, Tom already foresees the steps he needs to take. He methodically plans to use the deceased Dickie as a scapegoat, ensuring the innocence of his own persona. Additionally, Marge and Dickie's father arrive, both eager to understand what has happened. In today's world, with DNA technology omnipresent and the internet reaching every corner of the globe, it's hard to imagine Tom successfully weaving such elaborate lies. However, by placing ourselves in the context and technological conditions of that time, we can see that the novel's second half is generally plausible. Tom needed to accomplish the following to complete these seemingly impossible tasks. First, he had to mix up the waters, traveling between various cities in Italy and France, all the while creating complex fictional journeys to confuse the police. This allowed him to interact with different officers under different identities while ensuring that he wasn't recognized by acquaintances when he assumed Dickie's identity. Second, when facing Marge and Dickie's father, he needed to continually reinforce the image of Dickie as irresponsible and dissolute, gradually manipulating them psychologically to suspect that Dickie had intentionally run away or even committed suicide. Finally, once people gradually accepted Tom's fabricated stories about Dickie, he slowly phased out Dickie's identity while allowing the long-missing Tom to re-emerge. All he needed was a change of location, and Tom reverted to being Tom Ripley, albeit with everything that used to belong to Dickie. This is the most challenging part of the entire novel, a showcase of Highsmith's literary prowess. She introduced one trouble after another for Tom and meticulously arranged for him to resolve each one in accordance with the principles and steps mentioned earlier. There were no coincidences. Everything was achieved through meticulous logic and a gambler's mindset. Moreover, all actions were consistent with the characters involved. The intricacy and precision of these details can only be fully appreciated through close reading, word by word. Tom Ripley's story continues in the next four books of the series. He commits various heinous acts but also stands up for what he perceives as justice, evoking mixed feelings. He roams through European countries, navigating the worlds of law-abiding citizens, criminals, and those in between, somehow miraculously avoiding being ensnared by anyone. He even has a seemingly perfect marriage and a seemingly intact family. Of course, everything stops at seemingly. He continues seeking various outfits while elevating his own identity from an actor to a director. Various ordinary individuals with psychologically fatal weaknesses are the suitable roles he seeks among the masses. Eventually, as he becomes more adept, he no longer needs to personally get involved. Instead, he can manipulate and change the life trajectories of these roles, guiding them to transform and be reborn, orchestrating this grand play like a hypnotist, scene by scene. During Patricia Highsmith's lifetime, she was often compared to the queen of mystery Agatha Christie, but she dismissed this comparison. Indeed, there were significant differences in their styles, and these differences reflect the distinction between traditional detective mysteries and modern crime novels. Christie's works followed the traditional detective-driven route, with the suspense lying in whodunit. The most enticing aspect was the beauty of the logical process displayed as good triumphed over evil. However, there was never any suspense about the conclusion, good must prevail over evil, a premise that provided the indispensable sense of security for fans of detective novels. In Highsmith's works, on the other hand, the answer to whodunit is revealed early on, and readers are aware that Tom committed the murders. Yet, despite knowing that Tom is the culprit, readers can't help but follow his perspective, experiencing fear and anxiety, grappling with an indescribable sense of distress. What's even more unsettling is that, until the very end of the novel, the case remains unsolved, and justice can't prevail over evil, leaving the wrongdoer to escape unpunished. What's even more thrilling is that, at times, due to glimpses into the criminal's inner world, readers may develop a degree of sympathy for him, forcing them to confront inner turmoil and engage more deeply and directly with the concept of evil itself. As such, crime novels, in addition to providing the intellectual pleasure of a mental puzzle, can also stimulate readers to contemplate social contradictions and complex human nature, 
often the more emphasized themes in crime novels. Tom's self-delusions are a result of his personality, the influence of a society that encourages consumption permeating his subconscious, and the pressure exerted by mainstream groups on marginalized individuals. Tom isn't inherently a cold-blooded murderer. When reading the novel, readers witness, experience, and even empathize with his gradual descent into a quagmire. Unlike those one-dimensional villains, the talented Mr. Ripley reveals a deeper essence behind criminal behavior. Therefore, discussions and analyses of this book often transcend the genre of crime fiction, delving into broader perspectives. It's worth noting that around the time the talented Mr. Ripley was published, the FBI established a research project specifically aimed at conducting scientific investigations into criminal behavior. They used interviews to understand killers' upbringing, motives, and more, gradually developing what they called psychological profile descriptions. This approach helped law enforcement more accurately identify investigative directions in criminal cases. Interestingly, the vast amount of first-hand data produced by this project was presented in a manner akin to literature. The psychological profiles derived from these cases share commonalities with the fictional criminal psychology portrayed in the talented Mr. Ripley on many levels. In terms of characterization and analysis quality, the latter attains a depth that general research finds hard to match. Therefore, it can be confidently said that from both a scientific and literary perspective, the talented Mr. Ripley is a precious and irreplaceable work. All right, we'll conclude the interpretation here. Let's recap the key points of this episode. Firstly, we discussed the author, American female writer Patricia Highsmith, and her novel The Talented Mr. Ripley. Patricia Highsmith ranked first among Time Magazine's list of the 50 greatest crime novelists, and her most significant work, The Talented Mr. Ripley, not only won the Edgar Allan Poe Award and the French Grand Prix de Literature Policière, but has also been adapted into films and TV series, exerting a profound influence globally. Throughout her life, Highsmith struggled with mental instability, often displaying pathological tendencies. The relationship between these symptoms and her writing is complex and peculiar. On one hand, her fiction deepened her delusions, frequently trapping her in the world she created. On the other hand, Highsmith's works delved deeply into the criminal psyche, which, in turn, suppressed her antisocial tendencies in the real world. Secondly, we discussed the concept of the alter ego mentioned in the book. From a psychological perspective, Tom and Dickie form an alter ego relationship. This theme is a recurring element in many of Highsmith's works. Throughout her career, she explored the intricate tension between a person's alter ego and their true self, examining the potential energy generated by this relationship. When it comes to criminal behavior, she delved into the destructive power of this energy. Lastly, we talked about the stark differences between traditional detective mystery novels and modern crime novels. Traditional detective novels are characterized by a focus on whodunit, with the suspense centered on uncovering the identity of the culprit. In contrast, modern crime novels, like the talented Mr. Ripley, often reveal the identity of the perpetrator early on. These novels provoke readers to contemplate social contradictions and complex human nature. In Highsmith's works, Readers follow the criminal protagonist's perspective, experiencing fear, empathy, and inner turmoil, all while the case remains unsolved, challenging conventional notions of justice. The novels delve into the deeper essence of criminal behavior, moving beyond one-dimensional villains and forcing readers to confront the concept of evil in a more profound and direct manner. As a result, discussions and analyses of such novels often transcend the confines of genre fiction entering broader horizons. In summary, Patricia Highsmith's The Talented Mr. Ripley is a masterpiece that explores the depths of human psychology and the complexities of criminal behavior, challenging traditional crime fiction conventions. It remains a valuable and unique contribution to both literature and the study of criminal psychology. Well, that concludes the content for this episode. If you enjoyed my video, please click like, subscribe to my channel, and share it with your friends. Thank you.